Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Good morning, church. It's great to be... <laughs> Glad to be in the house of God this morning. How exciting. Um, you guys get to listen to me again. <laughs> How thrilled you, you all must be. Um, I thought after last time I might have got out of it, but no. Here he goes again. Yeah, come on, come on. Dennis, you're my, you're my guy. All right. So I think it's always prudent that we start with a joke. There were two old men. Let's call them Mike and Jonna. Sit at a park and <laughs> at a bench feeding pigeons and talking about baseball. Mike turns to Jonna and asks, do you think there's baseball in heaven? Jonna thinks about it for a minute and replies, I don't know. But let's make a deal. If I die first, I'll come back and tell you if there's baseball in heaven. And if you die first, you do the same. They shake hands on it. But sadly, a few months later, Mike passes. Soon afterwards, Jonna is sitting at the the park feeding the pigeons and he hears Jonna 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 responds Mike is that you yes it is whispered Mike's glorified body Jonna still amazed so is there baseball in heaven well Mike says there's good news and there's bad news give me the good news first Jonna says Mike says well there's baseball in heaven and Jonna says that's great what news could possibly be bad enough to ruin that Mike sighs and whispers, you're pitching on Friday. <laughs> Took a little, while, little bit for that one to sink in, but. Just remember who won <laughs> Hence we use your name, Jonna. <laughs> I also remember who pays the bills, so. I'd like to ask you all a few questions, and I'd prefer if you answered them internally, <laughs> not out loud, but as honestly as you can. Do you live a life for the here and the now? Is your week from pay week to pay week? Do you have goals? Do you have dreams that you want to achieve in your life? Are you happy? Do you know where you are headed at the end of this life? Do you think about heaven? Or do you think about eternity? And if so, does that change the outlook on your life? Colossians 3.2 says this, set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, it says in the Amplified, not on things that are on earth, which have only temporal value. Why don't we just take a moment and let's pray. And let's just bring this, uh, this message and this time to God. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this time together. I pray that today, Lord Jesus, that these words that are spoken are your words and not my own. That, Lord, we will have hearts to receive exactly what you have for us this morning. I pray, Jesus, that we listen and we obey. That we look to our Father in heaven and we look to our future in you. And we understand, Lord Jesus... What it is to me, what it is to have you as our Lord and Saviour. I pray today, Lord Jesus, that you equip us and prepare us for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. It's amazing how things can spiral when you pursue earthly things. Our minds become cluttered. We find it difficult to focus. We try to do so much in our own strength. And I was like this until last night trying to put all of my own strength in this particular message, how to formulate it in such a way that it had cohesion, clarity, depth, and value. And do you know what I discovered? I had it all wrong. In my pursuit for reaching the perfect product, I had eliminated the heavenly things and was fixated on the temporal, but not the eternal. So I want us to come back to those two questions, that, those two last questions that I asked previously. Do you think about heaven or eternity? And if you do, would it change the outlook of your life? 
The reason I got to that place was a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to lead a team and I was stepping into a role and the team was, was, was going well, but what was happening was on the surface, every, everything seemed to be going okay. But underneath, it was like, you know, the duck's legs, you know, going cha chaotically underneath the water. And things were starting to fall apart a little bit. I was to step into this role and had very limited experience, but I knew that God had a plan and a purpose for why I was stepping into that role and how that was going to have an effect in the future. And so one thing that I did notice in this team was that there was a lack of clarity or a lack of vision or a lack of direction. And so I felt that God say to me, the first thing I had to do was establish vision, establish a direction in which the team needed to go. So this was a church organizer. I was part of the department of the church. And so I had God dropped two words into my, into my spirit. And those two words were eternal perspective. So I thought, that's great, jotted it down, eternal perspective. Everyone, everyone in church loves a catchphrase, don't they? Eternal perspective or an acronym of some description or um, people love all the same things starting with the same letter, you know. Yeah, what are they called? Alliterations. Alliterations. Um, that's my uh, English limitations there. <laughs> so I thought, eternal perspective, beauty. That's good, jot that down. That sounds, sounds mint when I delivered that eternal perspective everyone's going to get on board. And then I felt the Holy Spirit say, mm, mm, is it cool? Is it really cool? Do you understand what it means to have an eternal perspective? And I thought to myself, not really. I know that I, I know to believe in Jesus and I know that I know that there is eternity and I believe in heaven and I believe in hell and I, I believe that we're picking the right side. But did I really live my life with an eternal perspective? So I'm going to break down the two words for you before we move on. And I'm going to, I will most likely muck up the name, <laughs> the Latin word for this. So here we go. Definition for perspective is, oh, now I've, I've said it, persifier, I don't know, persifier, I don't know. It's, it's not up there, it doesn't matter, but it's Latin. <laughs> Nice work, Ron. <laughs> it's something, it sounds like perspective, but anyway, it's Latin. So, uh, <laughs> they always say in the, like the um, preaching for dummies, use Latin. Um, so <laughs> it's working well, <laughs> it's working out well. <laughs> anyway, the Latin word for perspective is that one, and it means to look through or to look beyond. Perspective is everything. Our own perspective is the lens in which we view our life and most importantly, God's role in our life. Your perspective is formed by what you know is true. And as Christians, this wisdom should come from the word of God. Let's go to the word eternal. Think eternity, think everlasting, alpha and omega, I am, and the word forever. Now the word forever in the Hebrew language is olam, meaning eternity. So the word forever and eternity are actually the same word. And that word uh, is defined by the infinite everlasting expanse of God and his creation. God is called in Genesis 21, 33, el olam, meaning everlasting God. It is in our most simplest form that eternity is God. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, he has made everything suited to its time. Also, he has given human beings an awareness of eternity in such a way that they can't fully comprehend the meaning of beginning to end, the things God does. Romans 1.20 says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, what, through everything God made they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his external power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing who God is. An eternal perspective is something that shifts the way in which we view life. When we take on an eternal perspective, we understand that we don't actually live for the here and now. 
where we don't actually live for tomorrow and we don't actually live for next week. It's good to have plans and it's good to have goals and all of that sort of thing. But when we have an eternal perspective, it actually shifts the way in which we think about others. It shifts the way in we think about serving. It, thinks, it shifts the way in which we think about uh, reaching other people. And so an eternal perspective, it even shifts the way we uh, develop and grow our family and educate our kids. God has given us freedom to live life. He actually wants us to live with freedom, with peace, enthusiasm, and how often we're told that we should do things contrary to what God has given us. Sometimes we focus a little bit more on the things that we're not supposed to do instead of the blessings and the enjoyment that God gives us. God wants us to live a free life and a life with eternal perspective. So today I'd like to bring you three key points, three lenses I think that will help us and encourage us to live a life not of the temporal but of the eternal. That yes, we are in the world, but we, not, we actually hold eternal values. First point, live with joy. It's going to go up there. Happiness is an emotion, one that is temporary and driven by circumstance. Joy is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Jack Hiles quotes saying, happiness is untested delight. Joy is delight that is tested. C.S. Lewis says, joy is the serious business of heaven. Who remembers that song, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. It's a tune. It's a tune. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. comes directly from Philippians 4. When you sing that song, oh, we used to sing it, and we used to clap, and we used to have fun, and then I didn't actually, and then I'd go home, and you'd get in trouble. As a kid, I'd get in trouble, and the joy of the Lord just departed from my life as soon as I got, <laughs> just went out the door. I was mucking around as a kid, and then we were singing joy, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, and my dad gave me a hiding, and I didn't feel that joy as much as I, as I wanted to at the time. But joy is a zest for life and enthusiasm. Understanding the joy of the Lord is not through experience or possessions, but a heart and a mind determination that even when things on the outside are dreary, inwardly we determine that through obedience we will not let our circumstances dominate our actions. Happiness is temporal. Joy is eternal. Happiness we find in possessions, worldly things, but joy goes beyond our here and now. See, if we applied happiness in our circumstances, we wouldn't find a lot of happiness at times. They, they'll, they'll come and go very quickly, and it's not a bad thing to find happiness. But joy is something that's a lot deeper. Joy goes deeper into our spirit, and it is something that is directly from the Holy Spirit. See, in the, when we look at the fruits of the spirit, there is love, and the second one is joy. I don't believe that that's an accident. I believe that joy is one of the things that we're going to experience in life because it's actually a heavenly value. It's a heavenly virtue. And for us as Christians, to have joy is one of the best things that we can do. If we can find joy in life, if we can joy, find joy in our circumstances, then we are going to look through life with a different set of lenses than if we just looked at it through our happiness. So live with joy. But you say, Chris, how do I live with joy? Not joy, the lady. Another, like joy as a, <laughs> as a, as a fruit of the spirit. Psalm 30 Verse 5 says, For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. That word joy used in that particular psalm is another Hebrew word called renah. And again, I apologise for all of our Jewish friends um, if I'm pronouncing these wrong, but it, it's renah. And it's both the word for singing and praise and for joy. So joy and singing in praise is renah. In Habakkuk, we also see the word joy, which is pronounced gil in the Hebrew language, and it means to leap or dance for joy. 
Now, if you were to look at that particular passage in Habakkuk, they are going through a horrific set of circumstances, but they were still able to find joy at that time to leap and to dance and to sing songs of praise to God. So to have an eternal perspective, it helps us with our understanding of praise. Now, praise is not just words or praise is not what we do here on a Sunday and it's not the fast song of this worship set. Just a, just a, a side note. It's not the quick songs. We tend to fall into that concept of are we going to do praise and we're going to do worship. And uh, praise is more than just the fast song on a Sunday morning. Some of you may be aware that there are seven words or seven Hebrew words for praise. I'm actually going to go through all of them because I actually think that they are very important for us to understand what these words mean because it actually helps us shift our perspective on what it means to praise God. The first one is halal. Uh, not the meat, but it is halal and is the primary Hebrew wo- root word for praise. Our word hallelujah comes from this base word and it means to be clear, to praise, to shine, to boast, to rave, to celebrate, or to, clamorous, to be clamorously foolish. That's not a bad one, is it? To be foolish in the presence of our God. The next one is yada. Uh, this is a verb with a root meaning of extending hands or an extended hand. To throw out the hand, therefore to worship with extended hands, to lift up the hands according to the lexicon, which is the, like the Hebrew dictionary, the opposite meaning is to bemoan or the wringing of hands in despair. Next you have tauda, T-A-W-D-A-H. And it comes from the same principal word as yada, but it is used more specifically Tauda literally means an extension of the hand in adoration or acceptance. By way of application, it is, the, it is apparent in the Psalms and everywhere else it is used for thanking God for things not yet received, as well as things already at hand. That's an interesting one, that one, because again, if we were to apply circumstance and happiness to our circumstances, that wouldn't apply. See, If we were to look at our circumstances and not have joy or praise for the things that are here and the things that are to come, then it helps us, well, we then get sidetracked and we start to look at our circumstances rather than the promises. The next one is shabak, and it means to shout, to address in a loud tone, and is to command or to triumph. That's an authority one. We are able to triumph in our praise to him. The next one, next one is Barak, uh, not the Obama, but just Barak. And it means to kneel down, to bless God as an act of adoration. It also means to salute. In uh, ancient times, it was not uncommon that when you walked into the presence of the king, that one knelt but it was actually more common for one to lie like this. I was debating whether I'd do that, um, but it was to, it's to fully prostrate yourself, to lie down and, because there's, you can't get any lower than having your face down and lying prostrate on the ground. And it's the same sort of attitude when we come into the presence of our king. Now, I don't expect as we walk in the doors that everyone lays on the ground during worship, we could, could be a new thing, <laughs> set the tone. Um, but what it means is to prepare our hearts for a laying down so that he can actually then do a work in our life. Seventh, oh, sixth one is zama, which means to pluck the strings of an instrument, to sing, to praise a musical word, which is largely involving joyful expression of music with musical instruments. And then we have... Tehillah, which is derived from the word halal and means the singing of halals or the singing of praises, to sing or to laud, perceived in music and singing hymns of the spirit of praise, make rejoicing a constant discipline. Notice that the only ones that use music 
are the last two. There's five there of praise that don't involve any type of music. I used to think that praise and worship was only something that I did on a Sunday morning, that I'd sort of get myself ready for praise and worship on a Sunday, and then that was it for the week. You know, you might sing along to some hill song or something in the car or whatever, but it didn't really make sense for me to praise God outside of church. But when I started to look at these particular words and started to understand that when we actually learn to praise, it actually gives over something of ourselves. It stops us looking inwardly and helps us to start looking outwardly. When we start to praise, we start to actually rejoice because we start to thank God for what he's done and we start to thank God for what he's going to do in the future. And we start to look more eternally because we are praising an eternal God who loves us. And so when we start to look at rejoicing and living a life full of joy, that actually becomes contagious. As Christians, we have the greatest gift of all. I would say that as Christians, being born again into salvation, knowing that our eternity is in heaven, is the greatest gift of all. And something that we should be excited about. Something that we should rejoice in. Something that we should actually live a life full of blessing because God wants that to happen. Yes, there are going to be circumstances. Yes, there are going to be trials. There are going to be those things all the time. But we don't look at the temporal, we look at the eternal. And when we start to view our world with eternal perspective, it actually changes the way in which we live our life today. The second point, second encouragement of how we can live is to live with light. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, and it's one of the parables that Jesus was talking about in the uh, Beatitudes, I believe, and it says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. We are those lamps. As in God, it says, you are the light. Now, I struggled with that because Jesus also refers to himself as the light. And I'm like, well, how can he be light and how can we be light? And I don't want to blaspheme saying that I'm light. But what I came to understand is that it's almost like the moon. See, the moon doesn't have a, isn't a light source on its own. The moon reflects the light. It reflects the sun as we are to reflect Christ. See, when we live a life that reflects him, we're set apart. 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 to 12 says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls, but be careful to live properly and among, live properly among your unbelieving neighbours. Then, if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honourable behaviour and they will give, give honour to God when he judges the world. I don't know if you can see up in this little image here, but that's a traditional Jewish or Hebrew lamp. And what, actually, what you've got there is you've got the vessel, you've got the oil, and then you've actually got the wick and the flame itself. The lamp, as it says in that scripture, that we are to be a lamp, that we are to give off light, that we are the light of the world. That lamp, that uh, the actual vessel itself is made of clay, and then that's traditionally olive oil, which just sits in the middle, and then that wick is the, and that is the fuel that then lights the flame. We are that vessel. Those who believe in Jesus and those that call Jesus Christ our saviour, we are those vessels. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of references to scripture and the parallels between oil and Holy Spirit. And then 
those two things are useless without a flame. Well, the light doesn't actually work unless there's a spark. So we've got a vessel, we've got the oil, which is the fuel source, and then we actually have the light, which is the lamp or the flame. God calls us to be the light of the world. But we actually have to make sure that we aren't just living life empty. We actually have to be topped up. We actually have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We actually have to then, with the filling of the Holy Spirit, activate it. We then have to activate the Holy Spirit so that we do become a light. And I know that in our dark world, it's easy to look around the situation and the circumstances and say, I don't know where I can be a light. I don't know where I fit in with my, you know, to understand where my position is here. But there's very simple things that we can do to be light. I was a concreter, as some of you may know. And if anyone knows anything about concreters, um, nothing tests your faith like working with concreters. <laughs> and I was working with Les. No, I'm only kidding. Um, and, uh, and so you would, I would constantly rock up to site. And it was like... <laughs> Here we go again. We're, 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 we're into it. And so we've got, we've got guys who are like the, the, the filth that comes from their mouths and all that sort of stuff. It's really, it's really gobsmacking to, to actually see what some of these guys sort of talk about. And I, you know, it blows your mind. But I knew that I could either take two options. I could sort of just blend in and sort of just sort of be one of the guys, and so that, you know, I didn't stand out like a sore thumb, or I could be set apart. I could be a very small light in a dark place. But all you need to do is only one little bit of light, and it actually gets rid of darkness completely. And so you would talk to these guys and they would be having a conversation and then all of a sudden the phone comes out and the language and all that sort of stuff. And I just had to find myself just gently, gently drift away to the other side and take myself out of the picture for the time being. But do you know what? As I set myself apart and as I actually made a choice to say, no, I'm not going to blend in here, but I'm actually going to be set apart for Christ, people noticed it. People noticed that when I didn't participate in the same filth, when I didn't participate in the same things that they found funny, that they noticed it. And when, you actually came, when they actually came to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, they actually asked you, what's different? Not in a weird way, <laughs> but what's different? What sets you apart? And you know, nothing, nothing opens up a door like someone coming and asking you a question about what's different about in your life. What is shining in your world that I'm interested in? I believe Jesus uses things like salt and light and those sorts of descriptions because he actually wants us to be looking eternally so that we live the life here with the eternal perspective. When we understand that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, when we understand that he is on fire inside of us, then that oil or that vessel who we are that holds the oil has greater meaning. Living, the li living life in the Spirit requires diligence. Now I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8, but I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase. And this talks about living life in the spirit. And we're going to go from verse 9 down to verse 11. And it says, But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than him. Again, looking outwardly. Anyone, of course, who, is, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him in, and, he, and whom dwell, in, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead 
moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing life, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, he does as surely as he did in Christ. You are delivered from that dead life. With this spirit living in you, you bo your body will be as alive as Christ's. When the Holy Spirit dwells within you, you are alive in Christ. When you welcome him in, you are alive in him. See, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same one that lives in you. We actually have the opportunity to then be a light for others in this dark world. Live a life of light. As we are living a life filled by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't actually allow too much room for passivity. Passive Christians. Not a lot, a lot, not a lot of room for passiveness, passivity, being passive, being, she'll be right, mate. God wants us on fire for him, burning with a passion because he knows the eternal consequences and the eternal blessing for those who find him. Uh, third point, Jenna, I might get you to come up, thanks. The third encouragement for us today in how we can live with an eternal perspective is actually to live for eternity. Charles Swindle says, the essence of Christianity is not the externals, but the eternals. The organ of life's richest delight is not the stomach, but it is the heart. Again, I'm going to go back to Romans for one moment. Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase, and it says this. This resurrection life you receive from God is not timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know... know we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming for us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through himself. For we go through the hard times with him, and then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him also. Jesus is our greatest eternal gift. For those that know Jesus and call Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, he is the greatest gift of all. When we serve in church, serve with an eternal perspective. When you raise your kids, raise your kids with an eternal perspective. When you move into your workplace and you work in this current life, work with an eternal perspective. Because the blessings are good here on earth, but the eternal values that come at the end of the day are much bigger, much better. See, it's, again, it says in Colossians that all of the things that are here on earth will pass away. If we put our hope and our faith and our trust in the things that are here, unfortunately, we set ourselves up for disappointment. Those things go rusty, they fall apart, and again, it's happiness, it's temporal. But when we, when we can view life and we can view this current life that we live as Christians and as believers with an eternal hope that one, Jesus is coming again and two, we have a future in heaven with him, it actually helps me to be ready, to be active, to be on the move. See, I don't know when my time is up and neither does anyone else. But what I do know is that God has given me an opportunity to share the light. God has given me an opportunity to live life with joy, to be infectious with my living. God has then given me the opportunity to help others and to serve in whatever capacity with an eternal perspective. Why? Because it is an eternal virtue. It goes beyond the here and the now. When I understand who God is and I understand his promises, and I understand what he wants from me, I can then use that 
to have a greater impact in the world around me. Eternal perspective is kingdom perspective. It means laying aside selfish ambitions, our own desires for the betterment of the kingdom. I, uh, Andre, uh, Olivier, uh, he said one of the, and I think this has been said a couple of times, but he said for God's kingdom to come, we've got to pretty much lay, us, lay down our own kingdom. Our kingdom has to go. And that's a real challenge because naturally as humans, we're selfish. Naturally as humans, we don't tend to dwell on the, on the good things. We tend to dwell on the bad things. It's just human nature. But a heavenly perspective and an eternal perspective is actually a shift in our mind. We actually have to shift our heart. We actually have to shift our satellite towards God. It's not just something that happens, but it's something that is uh, something that you actually have to determine after. Joy, like joy. Joy doesn't just come. It's something that we have to chase after. It's something that we actually have to apply from here and here. So I've got two questions to ask today. And I, and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me throughout the course of the week, there are a lot of people that have lost hope, that have uh, lost a sense of of what is the meaning of what we're doing here. It could be in a very slight way or it could be in a fairly major way. But I felt that God was saying to me, there are people even sitting in the congregation that are limiting what he can do through them because they've lost their eternal perspective or they haven't understood what an eternal perspective is. They've lost hope. I'd like to pray for those people today. And secondly, I'd like to pray for those that don't know Jesus, that haven't had the opportunity to actually have the greatest gift of all come into their life. Those that don't know where they're going at the end of the day. Because as believers in Jesus, we have an exciting opportunity to go out into all the world and be a light to actually pass on this great gift that we have, not to hide it under a basket, but to go forward and to go out and to use exactly what Christ has called us to do. So why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes for one moment. If you've found yourself in this time uh, that your hope has been diminished, your joy has been robbed. That you don't quite grasp the concept of an eternal perspective. Just where you are, because I want to pray, I just ask you to lift your hands or a hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just pray right now that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That you want us to take a hold of the promises that you've made. And for these people that have lift their, lifted their hands at this moment, Lord Jesus, I just pray for each and every one of them, Lord Jesus, that you will instill into them a desire to chase hope, joy, and an eternal perspective. Lord, I pray that you sow deep down into their hearts, Lord Jesus, what it means to look to you first and to live a life full of enthusiasm, full of joy, and help them to realise once again, Lord Jesus, that they carry inside of them the greatest gift of all. Equip them, Lord Jesus, in your precious and holy name, amen. And while we still have our heads bowed, I just want to pose this last question. For those that may not have come into a relationship with Jesus, for those that feel that it's something that they've, they've even come to church for many years, but you haven't got that intimate relationship with Jesus, 
If that's you and you would like to understand what it, what it means to have the greatest gift of all, uh, I'm just going to invite you to lift your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. If you did lift your hands, we're all going to say this prayer together. Uh, and, but I want you to pray that prayer from the depths of your heart. Pray it as a this is a time that you're going to come to him with humbleness and ready to receive what he has, the greatest gift of all. So if you guys, everyone could repeat, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your death on the cross. It was through your death that you provided the perfect sacrifice. It was through your death that we now have a chance at eternal life. We are forever thankful that you gave yourself for our sins and our iniquities. Today, Lord Jesus, I pray and I invite you into my life that today is like no other day. Today is the start of a journey and a lifetime with you in control of my life. I thank you for your, the resurrection power. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can call you our saviour. In Jesus' name, amen. One last word of encouragement before we go. I might invite the rest of the band to come up. We can finish with a song. When you go out today, and I encourage you, I encourage you in a couple of different ways. Take a look at those seven words of praise and how you can apply them into your world. I encourage you that, our, that, that praise is, is not just something that we do here on a Sunday, but praise is actually something that stems from the bottom of our, our spirit and something that we can do every day. Secondly, I encourage you to live a life of joy. Rejoice in the fact that we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's coming again. We know where our eternal home is. And rejoice. Enjoy life. Smile. Do the things that we're, God's called us to do. Because as we live a life like that, how infectious and how amazing it would, it would be to be those types of people that people look to and say, hey, I want to be like that, not because of us, but because of who's inside of us.